Hello, this is Bob Wood. Welcome to Talking About the Bible podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about one of those chapters of the Bible that really gets me excited. It's a chapter where it really answers a lot of questions. I get questions all the time about why some Old Testament passage doesn't seem to apply to us as Christians. Why can we eat shrimp, hamburgers, and bacon, and pork chops, but the Jews can't? And the Old Testament says, don't eat pork, don't eat certain kinds of seafood. Why can I wear a cotton shirt and nylon shorts? That's forbidden in the Old Testament laws of Moses. And why do we celebrate our holy day as Christians on Sunday, the first day of the week, as opposed to the Sabbath, which is supposed to be Friday night to Saturday night in the Old Testament, the last day of the week? Why don't Christians follow the Old Testament laws? Today, we're going to look at Acts chapter 15 and Genesis chapter 9, and we're going to find the answer to those questions. Now, as we look at Acts chapter 15, I need to let you know the context of the story. Acts, of course, is a story about the apostles from the time that Jesus ascends into heaven. Then they get the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 10. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes on them, and they preach and have a great revival in Jerusalem. And then the stories go on and tell us how the apostles first fulfill Jesus' command to, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then ultimately to the other parts of the world. And the story follows originally Peter and John, then it, and Philip and Stephen, and then it expands into following Paul and his companions. Now, Paul and his companions, in this case Barnabas, had traveled throughout what we would now call Turkey, and they had um, a, their evangelistic mission seemed to turn from working with Jews to working with everybody, and specifically with Gentiles. And they saw Gentiles coming to Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit, just had happened in some of the other cases to some of the other apostles. And then in chapter 15, starting in verse 1 of Acts, we see what happens when they return back to Antioch, which was their home base, their city that, and the church that had sent them out. They go back and report what happens, and as they get there, this is how the story begins. Acts 15.1, Now some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul and Barnabas had a major argument and debate with them. The church appointed Paul and Barnabas and some others from among them to go up to meet with the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this point of disagreement. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they were related at length, the conversions of the Gentiles, and bringing great joy to all the brothers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things that God had done with them. As we can see in the story, that it started with a debate with a problem in Antioch about whether a Christian man needed to be circumcised. The Jewish law was very clear. Jews, on the eighth day, the boys were to be circumcised. When you converted into Judaism, it was also expected that you would become circumcised. So these preachers who had come from Jerusalem and shared with the uh, Gentile believers said, hey, you guys, you need to get circumcised. And so they decided to send a delegation to go and find out what the other apostles, other than Paul, thought about this issue. But some from the religious party of the Pharisees when they got to Jerusalem, this verse is talking about, but some from the religious party of the Pharisees who had believed stood up and said, it's necessary to circumcise the Gentiles and to order them to observe the law of Moses. So when they get to Jerusalem and they're met with the church and they're discussing the issue in a council, some of the Christians who had once been Pharisees, but now were believers in Christ, said it's necessary for the Gentiles that's people who are not Jewish, to be circumcised and they should be ordered to follow all the laws of Moses. So that means 
Paul and Barnabas' mission really needed to go back and fix everything because they had taught incorrectly that you didn't need to be circumcised and you didn't need to follow the laws of Moses. Now, continuing on in, in verse 6, it says, Both the apostles and the elders met together to li- deliberate about this matter. And who are the apostles and who are the elders? The apostles, we know, these are Jesus' original disciples and those who were called by him to spread the gospel. Elders seem to be a group of uh, people who were long-term followers of Jesus. Let's see what happens next. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God chose me to preach to the Gentiles so they would hear the message of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, has testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between them and us, cleansing their hearts by faith. So now, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. The whole group kept quiet and listened to Barnabas and Paul while they explained all the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles, through them. Paul and Barnabas give testimony, but really Peter's testimony is really critical because you have to remember, Peter was one of the original disciples. He's the leader of the group of the disciples. He is so important to that group that when he gets up and says, our ancestors and us couldn't bear the yoke, the difficult weight of the law of Moses, And why are we putting it on these believers? God has given testimony that they are his by giving these Gentiles the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the sign that showed Peter that there was nothing required other than faith. That was faith that saved you. Let's keep on reading. Verse 13, after they stopped speaking, Paul and Barnabas, that is, who stopped speaking, James replies, Brothers, listen to me. Simon, that's Peter's Jewish name, okay? Simon has explained how God first concerned himself to select from among the Gentiles a people for his name. The words of the prophets agree with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the fallen tent of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, namely all the Gentiles I have called to be my own, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. So we have a a guy get up. His name is James. Now, I need to let you know who this James is. This James is Jesus's brother, and he is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He is not only a person we know from Scripture, he is a historical character that other external or outside the Bible sources mention as being the leader of the Christians in Jerusalem until his death. Now, James gets up, and with real authority, he points out that that the Scriptures had said that the whole purpose of the Jews, the kingdom of David in Jerusalem after they'd been in bondage in, in, in Babylon, was so that they could be really a light to the Gentiles and that the light would draw all the Gentiles to God. What James is saying is that what has happened by the Holy Spirit being given to these believers is that it's a fulfillment of prophecy. He goes on, therefore, this is James talking, therefore I conclude that we should not cause extra difficulty for those among the Gentiles who are turning to God but that we should write them a letter telling them to, one, I put the one in there, abstain from things defiled by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For Moses has had those who proclaim him in every town from ancient times because he is read aloud in the synagogues 
every Sabbath. So what James is saying is that he's talking about these uh, four little laws, four basic laws, not the whole Mosaic law, but really these four laws. Don't defile yourself with idols. Don't have sexual immorality. Number three would be to abstain from drinking blood. And number four would be to not eat animals who have been strangled. There is a reason for why James uh, picks those laws. We're going to look at them next. And it comes from Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 through 4, the very beginning of the Bible, after the flood. You remember there was a big flood. God wiped out the people that were on the earth, except for eight people, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, and the animals in the flood story in Genesis. After Noah comes off the ark and is saved and the dry land has reemerged, uh, God talks to him. And this is what we're going to read now, what God says to Noah and his sons. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Every living creature of the earth and every bird of the sky will be terrified of you. Everything that creeps from the ground and all the fish of the sea are under your authority. You may eat any moving thing that lives. As I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat with its life, that is, its blood in it. That is the commandments that God gave to Noah. Now, Noah lives a long time before Moses, and these laws are the laws and a, a covenant that God makes with Noah and his descendants forever. When we see Moses comes out with, the, and God gives the laws of Moses, God gives his commandments to the Israelites, those are commandments specifically for the Israelites. It doesn't apply to everyone. It applies to the Israelites. But here, what James has done is he's gone back and said, all they have to do is follow the commandments that Noah gave and, of course, the commandments that Jesus taught, even though he doesn't specifically say that. Let's see what happens next. We're going to go back to Acts chapter 15, verse 22 through 35. Verse 22, Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to send men chosen from among them, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers, to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent this letter with them from the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile brothers and sisters in Antioch, Syria, and Sicily. Greetings. Since we have heard that some have gone out from among us with no orders from us and have confused you, upsetting your minds by what they said, we have unanimously decided to choose men to send to you along with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas, who will tell you these things themselves in person. For it seems best to the Holy Spirit and to us not to place any greater burden on you than these necessary rules that you abstain from meat that has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from doing these things, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were dismissed, they went down to Antioch and after gathering the entire group together, they delivered the letter. When they read it aloud, the people rejoiced at its encouragement. Both Judas and Silas, who were prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with a long speech. After they had spent some time there, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming, along with many others, the word of the Lord. Now, as you can see, that the rules that were given to the Gentile believers, which unless you're a Jewish Christian, applies to us, were only those four basic rules and, of course, the teachings of Jesus. The Old Testament laws do apply to us, but it's the laws of Noah that apply to us, not the laws of Moses. The laws that Noah had, which were for all the world, and not the specific ones that were for the Jewish people. So the four laws, again, that we have to do is not eat anything offered to idols, avoid 
sexual immorality. Do not drink blood and do not drink animals that have been strangled. Now, why is that? The, there is a prohibition against the eating of blood. And many scholars have wondered about that, why it is. There's clearly in the description in Noah is about that the blood is the life and that is true. But I think all, this is my opinion, I think all the way back there in Genesis, God knew what he was going to do. And he knew that the plan would eventually lead to the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross and that by his blood, we would be saved. So we don't need animal blood. But we do drink the communion, which we say is the blood of Christ that was given for us for the redemption of sins. That's the blood we drink, not the blood of animals, but the blood of Christ. It's a strange kind of symbolism for our modern era, but it is the Christian symbolism. So I hope this has helped you in understanding that you don't have to worry about all those Jewish laws. We're going to talk more about Acts in the coming months. If you have any questions, please write me at bob at revbobwood.com, bob at revbobwood.com, which you'll find my email in the description section of this video.